Do you ever wonder how grand structures like pyramids were built centuries ago? These seemingly impossible things happened because of religious influence. You see, historians and social scientists have found that religion is much more than just faith and rituals. Religion is a very interesting concept that shapes worldviews and behavior, and by extension, it shapes societies and their economic systems. So what I want to do today is take a closer look at how religion has shaped the economic development of various nations and societies over time. Time. Now look, there are many factors that impact the economics of a nation, and in this video, I'm trying to see if one of those many factors is religion. Because the idea is that historically, religion has impacted people's preferences. I mean, this is very obvious because various religions have their own practices and guidelines and so on. And this would of course impact a person's choices and preferences and how they go about their daily lives. And these preferences that people have impact their economic and political systems around them. Social scientists have observed this link for a while now. Take for example Max Weber, a renowned German sociologist. In his work, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, he argued that the Protestant ethic was key to the economic success of Protestant groups in early European capitalism. Why was that? It was probably because the Protestant tenets dictated that worldly success could be seen as a sign of eternal salvation. Simply put, it meant that working hard and achieving success was not just limited to making money and building wealth in the current lives that they had. It was also about proving one's worth and ensuring their place in heaven. This belief drove them towards entrepreneurship. It shaped their worldview and the actions taken by these Protestant elites. In Protestant countries, they invested the money they generated back into industry. I mean, it's no surprise that amongst the countries first to industrialize were majority Protestant. Now, this is of course a very simplistic view because there are many other major factors that contributed to industrialization, but the link between religion cannot be ignored. As our knowledge of history has advanced, another link observed by social scientists is that between the financial concept of interest lending and religion. This practice has its roots in ancient societies. Specifically, early religious systems in the ancient Near East actually encouraged this practice. By the way, the Near East is the region around the East Mediterranean, including some parts of West Asia. Anyway, some societies actually viewed inanimate matter as alive and capable of reproducing, just like plants, animals, and people. So the idea was that if you lent food money or monetary tokens, it was all right to charge interest. The logic was simple. Just as a seed planted in the ground can grow into a plant, money lent out can also grow through interest. This belief made interest lending or usury a very common practice in those areas. Now, there's another side to this story because you had other religious beliefs that gave rise to financial systems that forbid interest and forbid usury. This way of looking at usury came from the rise of Abrahamic religions because they held a different worldview. They preached a kind of universal brotherhood. A common feature is that these religions started off experiencing persecutions from the greater pagan societies around them at that time. That's why they needed to establish a strong sense of community. So the idea went like this. Just as one would feel bad about charging interest on a loan to their families, Faith argued that the same view should be extrapolated to their wider communities as well. That's why the Old Testament says that making a profit off a loan is exploiting that person and dishonoring God's covenant. This is similar in Islam as well, where lending and borrowing are social activities aimed at helping others, not something to be viewed as a profitable endeavor. That's why you can start to see how this led to the banning of interest within these societies. But this ban, or at least the limitation of usury, actually made societies better at commerce. It's during medieval times that we see the rise of such concepts as joint ventures and venture capitalism. The ban on interest made people more inclined to take business risks. You see, they viewed it like this. To simply invest the money and to expect it to be returned regardless of the success of the venture was to be making money simply by having money and not by taking any risk or doing any work or putting any sacrifice or effort at all. For example, in Islam, it was suggested that one should pursue investment through the sharing of profit and loss instead of sharing only the profit through interests. Without this concept of interest, merchants and traders had to collaborate more closely and share profits and losses, which actually ended up fostering a spirit of cooperation and innovation. Now, that's one side of the argument. The flip side is that with a ban on interest, many ventures actually could have been impeded. The idea of sharing profit and loss is good. However, the time that it would take to realize these gains would be a very long time. And therefore, it could be argued that it might actually slowed commercial innovations in certain ways. So there are always two ways of looking at this, but no matter what, it's undeniable that religious guidelines shaped how finance looked 
at introspect then. Now, with that in mind, I want to take a look at a few larger religious groups. But do keep in mind, the idea here is not to pass judgment or criticize any of these religious groups, but rather to examine objectively the relationship between their belief systems and economics, if there is one. Let's start with Christianity. Now, the way we think about this generalized concept of the West has a lot to do with religious evolution and influence in my view. I want to highlight this book. It's called The Weirdest People in the World by Joseph Henrik. He's a professor of evolutionary biology at Harvard University. In his book, he argued that Westerners had a very different view from other societies. He called them weird or Western educated, industrialized, rich and democratic. Now he linked this to the surprising byproduct of Christian teaching during medieval times. Joseph's argument is that the church back then reinforced and extended rules relating to incest. This banned marriages between anyone with potential blood, marital or even spiritual ties. This discouraged polygamy and adoption while encouraging newly married couples to live independently of their families. The aim was to break down traditional traditional family ties to extend the church's spiritual influence and also to build up the church's assets, for example, when the faithful bequeathed their money to the church. Of course, an unintended consequence of this policy was that it ended up making the European societies a bit more weird over time. Now, people became less conformist, more individualistic, they became more trusting of strangers, more cooperative and more analytical. People couldn't just depend on their families or their own tribes any longer. They had to adapt their ways of working, of interacting with strangers and form their own unique identity. Without the burden of traditional family ties, they gained greater freedom in their thoughts and actions. This newfound independence helped spark entrepreneurship and individualism. This would eventually lead to an economic revolution and a political one. Now, this is just one theory from Joseph, so take that with a pinch of salt. But coming back to Max Weber and his link between Protestantism and liberal capitalism, we find that the seeds were already being planted during the high Middle Ages. The Protestant Reformation that followed did not create a new mindset. Rather, it reinforced and gave religious legitimacy to the weird psychology that he talked about. And this has been developing over the previous centuries. Now, just in the same manner, we attempt to explain why market capitalism never took off in Eastern Europe. You see, Eastern Orthodoxy often impeded the rise of free market capitalism, property rights, and bureaucratic states in the region. While both Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy are Christian sects, they developed vast theological differences. This led to notable variations in attitudes and economic behavior. Now, Catholicism, the Western branch of Christianity, was closely associated to the papacy and the Holy Roman Empire. It emphasized individualism, legalism, and rationality, and it drew inspiration from Roman practices. In Catholicism, the relationship between a man and his God was legalistic. Followers had to adhere to divine rules and undergo penance for any misdeeds, all under the church's supervision. In contrast, Eastern Orthodoxy was influenced by Hellenic traditions. It focused more on introspection and communal values. Instead of emphasizing legal obligations, Orthodox theology highlights the relationship based on love and devotion. I want to move on to the 20th century now because it's remarkable how much religious influence shaped the adoption of ideologies in that era. You see, Eastern Europe ended up becoming more perceptive towards communism because Eastern Orthodoxy itself was communal in nature, so that makes sense. Orthodox believers tended to have more left-leaning political views. They held stronger opinions that governments should take greater responsibilities compared to individuals. This tendency was significant in shaping the political landscape under totalitarian regimes. This was observed by Nikolai Bardiev, a prominent Russian thinker in the 1930s. He was quick to note how communism thrived in countries with a strong Eastern Orthodox tradition. He suggested that the ideal communist was shaped by Orthodox Christian training, which instilled a sense of dedication and sacrifice. Berdiev also believed that the fervor and the commitment seen in communist regimes were a product of this Orthodox influence on the human spirit. In this context, Eastern Orthodoxy provided a fertile ground for the growth of communist regimes. Think of communist policies and institutions that were formed during this era. Collective agricultural practices, youth society organizations, a powerful state and secret service, a tight control over mobility, all these aligned very well with the pre-existing orthodox norms. Now that's again one side of the argument because some scholars argue that Protestant influence values such as hyper-individualism and competition created environments where fascist ideologies could take root or at least co-opt for their political ends. Now having said that, it's also important to note that in predominantly Catholic countries like Spain and Italy, fascism also emerged. 
but did not develop into genocidal ideologies to the same extent as in Germany. Now this suggests that while cultural and religious values played a role, other political, social and historical factors were also crucial in shaping the nature and impact of these fascist regimes. Okay, that was a bit about Christianity and its various sects and how they impacted political and economic policies. Like I said earlier, we can't draw a direct link between religion and these outcomes, but you can't ignore the influence of religion either. Now let's move on to ancient Egypt and how religion shaped their economies. Let's talk a little bit about the Great Pyramids. Even today, these giant structures would be very difficult to build because of the costs involved, but they still managed to do it back then. This was largely due to the structure of their economies, which was deeply influenced by their religious beliefs. One of the most important tenets of their religion was that the Pharaoh was a living deity. They were the medium through which gods communicated with the Egyptians and ensured harmony and peace and prosperity in their societies. This belief was reflected in their economic systems as well. The pharaoh's divine status justified a centralized economic system, also known as the palace economy. In this system, a significant portion of the wealth was directed to a central authority, the pharaoh. His palace collected goods and services from the population and redistributed them. The palace economy was based on this idea that the central administration was best suited to manage and allocate resources for the benefit of society. The palace was responsible for the well-being of the population, providing food, clothing and shelter often directly on the premises. This centralization allowed the state to maintain control over their economic activities and ensure that the needs of the people were being met. Sure, the pyramids were religious monuments, but they were also built to reinforce this centralized economy. The pyramids were vast and impressive. From the Great Pyramid of Maidam to the Pyramids of Dashur, these massive structures had their polished white limestone gleaming against the sun and they were sure to impress and the participation in building this was largely enforced by the workers' religious beliefs. You'd see thousands of workers from various industries working together. The workers were part of a grand effort rotated into different crews and tasks. You see, contrary to popular belief, the pyramids were not built by enslaved people. Rather, they were built by workers, and highly skilled ones at that, and they were compensated with high quality food, and it was viewed as an exciting task to work on such a large, prestigious project. This massive scale highlighted the central principle of the first nation state in history, the power of centralized authority, and this was made possible due to the influence of religion. Okay, let's move into East Asia. Historians have established that the free market capitalism concept thrived in regions influenced by Protestant Christianity. Protestant values encouraged hard work and individual success, which supported the growth of capitalism. In other places, capitalism had been a mixed success, not really translating into actual prosperity, but there was one exception, East Asia. Here, Confucianism had a strong influence, which was a major philosophical and ethical system. Like Protestantism, Confucianism encouraged traits that made societies it influenced more adept at thriving in capitalist economies. On the surface, they may seem similar, However, Confucianism also had teachings that go against the tenets of capitalism. One key difference is the stance on profit. Confucianism traditionally shunned excessive profit. The philosophy also teaches that the pursuit of profit is driven by greed. It emphasized that a superior person understands righteousness, while a lesser person focuses on profit. This prevented capitalism from emerging there in the first place, and the biggest reason being that it shunned excessive profit. So how did they view their economies? Once capitalism was imported from the West, it ended up creating a different motivation towards success. You see, Confucianism is also a legal, rational ideology. However, where it differs is a sense of obligation. Confucian society is based on five key relationships that define roles and obligations, and people are responsible for fulfilling these five duties. The theory was that while we can't control external conditions, we can control our own efforts and responsibilities. This focus on obligation is what helped motivate capitalist behavior in many ways. For example, many migrant workers from the East today are driven by a deep sense of obligation to their families and communities. This drive creates a powerful motivation for a meaningful life. They work hard not just for personal success, but to meet their responsibilities and support their loved ones. This focus on duty and responsibility also fuels entrepreneurial spirit. Like the Calvinistic ethic motivated believers to work hard and succeed, the Confucian ethic also motivated people to seize opportunities and fulfill their obligations. They channel their energy into work, 
driven by a sense of duty rather than the pursuit of profit. And all of this was shaped by religious beliefs. Now, I want to take a look at Islamic civilizations and their economies. Historians have often commented about the golden age of Islam. It was a period of incredible productivity, with Muslim thinkers making groundbreaking contributions. Their society was rich, literate, and highly urbanized for its time. But today, we do observe some nations that have started to lag in many areas, such as low gross national income per capita, literacy rates, years of schooling, and life expectancy. But then again, on the flip side, there are exceptions. Countries such as Malaysia, Turkey, the Gulf of States all possess really good metrics when it comes to development, especially in Turkey in recent decades, where they have tremendous strides in research and development. More young people are in tertiary education in Turkey than innovation powerhouses like the US, Japan, or Germany. Meanwhile, Turkey, UAE, and Malaysia all rank higher than the world average when it comes to innovation. So what about the Muslim majority countries that are lagging today? Some say that this decline is due to Western imperialism and their ongoing exploitation of resources. Now, this view is popular amongst many. However, successful Muslim countries also suffered Western imperialism in their histories. This claim also forgets the fact that we can notice some decline began much earlier, around the 12th century. After the 12th century, Europe had more significant scholars than the Arabic world, and this was long before the West had started to dominate the world. From this, we can see that maybe internal changes and doctrinal shifts may have played a major role in this decline in some Muslim-majority countries. It wasn't only the result of outside factors. You see, between the 8th and the 12th century, Muslim societies achieved remarkable philosophical and economic progress. This period, which I mentioned earlier, was called the Golden Age of Islam. Innovation in Muslim countries led to the development of algebra, the magnetic compass, navigation tools, pens, printing, and understanding disease spread and treatment. Arabic thinkers made original contributions in philosophy, astronomy, medicine, chemistry, geography, physics, optics, and mathematics. They did some groundbreaking work. And this great age of Arab science shows that there was no inherent barrier to tolerance, cosmopolitanism, or progress. It serves as historical proof that Islam was very much compatible with advanced in fact, from its early days, Islam had been very pro-scholarship. The religion's literary foundation is called the Quran, and some of its texts encourage literacy from the start since Muslims were required to be able to read it in the first place. Medieval Muslims took religious scholarship seriously. In fact, the quest of knowledge is supported by many verses in the Quran and the Hadith, which are the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad. Now, around the 12th century, we can notice some decline in some parts of the Muslim economies. Many scholars argue that this shift occurred due to the rise of Asharism, a theological school of thought. The Asharites were concerned that the influence of philosophies could lead Muslims to question religious authorities and diminish their piety. They believed that this could cause division in an already fracturing Muslim world, which was splitting into multiple states. State governments at this stage were worried about potential rebellions and rival sects gaining power. So they tried to fund educational initiatives that promoted Asharism, facilitating its rapid spread. In some regions, this school of thought became so influential that restrictions were placed on philosophical writings and their dissemination. From their perspective, the aim was to ensure societal stability and unity. However, an unintended consequence was that in some areas, there was a decline in certain forms of intellectual innovation. As Asharism became more prominent, it affected the Islamic world's intellectual and cultural lives. Scholars, artists, and philosophers who once thrived in a society that valued scholarship and innovation now faced increasing challenges. Now, it's also important to note that while Asharism emphasized theology over philosophy, many Asharite scholars themselves made significant contributions to science and philosophy. The impact of Asharism greatly varied across different regions of the Islamic world. I mean, some regions continued to support philosophical and scientific endeavors despite the theological shifts. Without sufficient resources and support, many intellectuals struggled to continue their work. This situation was exacerbated by the repeated foreign invasions that disrupted trade, further weakening the merchant and scholar classes. Meanwhile, religious and military elites gained more prominence for their roles in maintaining the Islamic world's stability. So, taking a step back, it's easy to appreciate that the Golden Age of Islam was marked by remarkable achievements in medicine, science, philosophy, and trade. This period of prosperity and intellectual flourishing had a profound impact on the global economy and finance, fostering a rich legacy of innovation and cultural exchange. 
However, the subsequent centuries saw a complex interplay of factors, including theological shifts that I mentioned earlier, political fragmentation, external invasions, all of which contributed to a decline in some areas. Now, if you fast forward to today and look at the economic landscape of the Muslim world, you'll see that it's diverse. Some countries are rich in natural resources and strategic investment, and they achieved great wealth and success and development, while others continue to face economic challenges. So the journey highlights how deeply intertwined religion, governance, and economic outcomes have been in the Muslim world over the centuries. Overall, by now, I think you'll agree that religion and economics have always been deeply interconnected. Through examining this relationship, we gain a clearer understanding of how the world operates today. Religion influences our values and behaviors, which then shapes our economic and political systems. This connection helps explain why different societies have vastly different economic practices. It also sheds light on why some non-Western countries have adapted to capitalism more effectively than others. The relationship between religion and economics is not always straightforward. We can see that over time, many societies have become more secular, and the impact of religion on economic systems starts to become less obvious, less visible. But looking beyond the surface, one can really appreciate how religion continues to impact economic development in complex and sometimes very surprising ways. Now, if you've stuck around till the end, I really appreciate if you could leave a handshake emoji in the comments. And if you have any thoughts on how religion and economics are interconnected, please do let me know in the comment section. I'll be very interested to hear your views. Thanks so much for watching. Please do subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you soon.